city of Lagos points of God has all Be the first to know from the north, south, east, west and around Africa. We break the news. Now you can catch all the actions live as the news spreads. We are Call TV News. Welcome to Call TV. Our 24 hour news station. A beautiful Tuesday morning here in Lagos. Good morning to you and thank you for joining us on Call Digest, your ultimate news and current affairs show exclusive to Call TV News. I am Nifemi Ogunsoye. Of course, we are continuing in our discussion, uh, turning our direction, our attention rather again to security this morning. Of course, if you check the front page of all the papers in case you missed it earlier, Every paper today is talking about Boko Haram and insurgency in northern Nigeria. Of course, the new twist of the story is that Obasanjo's son was shot in Mobi attacked. Of course, the writers here on the Vigad says ambushed with colleagues by Boko Haram, taken to hospital. Over 20 insurgents killed, three soldiers injured in Gondwell. Boko Haram controls three local. In fact, talking about areas controlled by Boko Haram. Of course, there's a picture here that we're going to show you uh, on the punch. Can we have it, MCR, talking about the regions in that particular state that are now being controlled by the Boko Haram. Of course, you see the, the map painted blue is Yobe, the one uh, painted white is Burnu, and yellow is Adamawa. So we have, um, we have Mate, Gala, Dikwa, Buni, Dambua, Mechika, Magadale, and Gwaza. Now, if you count that, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It looks like cities and towns large enough, and there seems to be uh, 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 there seems to be a lot of landmass now allegedly under the control of the insurgent uh, uh, of the insurgents in northeast Nigeria. There are also stories of um, Boko Haram moving towards the state capital in Bonn State. That's Medjugorje. Today on the show, we'll be turning our attention to the fate of the internally displaced persons in northern Nigeria. Now, UN High Commission of Refugees, UNHCR representative in Nigeria, says that there are currently about 650,000 internally displaced persons in Nigeria. Now, she said that in June 2014. Just yesterday, the Kano State Governor, Kwan Kwazo, says it's over 4 million northerners that were displaced. And he said that at the inauguration of the Northwest Zona Executives of the APC and Zona Rally in Sokoto. So, you can tell the numbers from the Bama attack to the Goza uh, you know, attack from Boko Haram declaring Islamic Caliphate. You really can tell. Kwakazu is saying people are moving all the way from this state to Abuja and even in neighboring countries. We'll also be joined this morning by the coordinator of NEMA in northeast Nigeria, it's presently in Medjugorje. We'll be finding out what the security report is like in Medjugorje. And of course, if it can confirm for us the number of internally displaced persons. Okay, we're joined by Mohammed Kana. Mohammed Kana, good morning. The situation is uh, uh, right now we have two identified and well uh, arranged two camps, two large camps. One at the uh, uh, NYC orientation camp, then the other one is at the uh, Yarwaga Mangal Secondary School. And uh, in each camp, uh, uh, the, uh, before then, we have uh, registered over 20,000 IDPs inside the camp. And then, uh, you know, in my degree, it's a relative relation of Bama uh, Town people. Uh, so many people have passed. So many of them inside the attack. But uh, so far now, I can say that the uh, uh, situation is uh, calm, and then the people, uh, the IDPs are settled. And then uh, right now, we are together with the high uh, power delegation from the NEMA, director planning and research, and then the director of such a rescue, uh, Air Command Charles in order to make a very large intervention in all these camps. 
time for us, please. The number Hello. of internally Hello, you displaced you? persons, as we speak now. Hello, are you with me? Yes, I am. I, I'm asking yeah, if you yeah. can confirm the number of internally displaced persons, as we speak now. Yeah. Hello. Mohammed, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you, but uh, it's, uh, the line is cracking. Okay, no, let me go over it again. Can you please confirm, Mohammed, the number yeah, of enough. internally displaced persons as we speak now? Yeah, what do you say? Can you confirm the number of internally displaced persons in Nigeria as we speak now as a result of the insurgency? In my degree, only a lot. Yes, yes. About 26,000. 26,000? Yes. In Meduguri? Yes. Okay, you made mention of camps. Where exactly are these 26,000 people? The orientation camp is right inside Meduguri, along uh, near Kano Station, uh, Kano Park, Kano Station Park. And then uh, the other one is uh, about... Uh, a kilometer deep distance is Yarwagamanga Secondary School. That is why we factor. And then uh, we we are working strongly with the, with the state government. The state government have formed a committee, which we are working together with them at all these camps uh, to provide soccer for these people. Okay. There are also reports of some Nigerians who have... Um who are taking refuge in neighboring countries like Cameroon, Sudan, and um, I said Sudan, you know, Cameroon, Ghana, and some other neighboring countries. Uh, what exactly is being done to ensure that those people's welfare are taken care of? Yeah, the, the, our IDCs are the neighboring countries, that is people from Gamboru and the villages around at the border. Okay. They are all inside Cameroon. So last week, uh, uh, we, you know, in such situation, there must be a tr diplomatic transaction in between Cameroon and Nigeria, and at the same time, other agencies that are necessary to facilitate the intervention on this IDP. Very, very important. So last week, we had uh, a serious collaborative meeting between the National Security Advisors Office, the Foreign Affairs, and then uh, all the states that are neighboring us, that is Bombe, for uh, Adama, Ainyobi, all we had a meeting on how we are going to. So community has, a committee has set uh, the national, the director general has set a committee in order to inspire A week or two we will be there in order to convince them back. Mm. There are also fears that Boko Haram uh, members are moving towards Meduguri to take over the state capital. What exactly can you say about that? Um, actually, uh, there was a fear uh, from, uh, from various quarters within Meduguri town that uh, these people are. The last, from last week up to now, uh, uh, the military has launched a serious offensive on this on the on the uh, insurgency, and uh, both Bahama, Pandega, and this thing are almost safe now, including Gwaza, and now they are moving toward Minchika. That is why you see that uh, today, last week, uh, you see them, uh, you find that all the insurgency, the insurgency have concentrated around Adamawa. People now are now. Uh, uh, up here around Gwambi uh, and then Madagali and some other areas. All these people have played Yola. So it, because it's uh, the result work of the military that are working along these things and uh, they are successfully making progress on that. It's all right. Thank you very much, Mohammed Kara, coordinator of um, NEMA, calling yeah. us yeah, uh, originally yeah, from Meduguri. Good to have you join us today. I'm joined now by our veteran public affairs analyst, Victor High. Thank you very much for joining us again this Tuesday morning. You saw the map and the numbers of um, towns or cities, whatever it is, that are yeah. now being captured by 
in, on the uh, Boko Haram. How exactly would you say the Nigerian military is faring, you know, as it is now with all the stories emerging from northeast Niger? Well, um, what is happening is, I mean, was obviously imminent. Um, first, the insurgents were operating from some piece of forest, and it was only a matter of time. I mean, some piece of forest is not um, exactly, um, how do I put it now, a granary of food, you know, or where you find a place where you find a reservoir of food of it's not a place where you get all all the comfort mm. and um which is why we found the occasional incursions okay. um to go for food to get supplies and if you like women to meet their needs as well and um you know, it was only, and you recall that there was a time when it was said that snakes were attacking them in the forest. It was not the most comfortable of places. And it was also a difficult place for terrain for the military as well, because not only were they operating for a piece of forest, which is, a, is, I mean, the way it is, you know, you can have caves and places where you might not be able to get see them very easily. And it's a place they're more familiar with. Uh, even when they're in the cities, mm. uh, the warfare was sort of guerrilla, which is not something our military was really prepared for. You know, so it, was, it was very difficult. We, our military have been known to be very efficient. They have been successful in uh, operations outside this country and within the country as well. But, you know, um, with what has been happening, obviously, and with increasing cooperation from countries like, you know, and the neighboring countries like Chad, Cameroon and the rest, they were running short of supply. So obviously they had to come out, you know, and begin to enter the cities. And you cannot enter the cities peaceably. No one is going to give you. They're armed with, I mean, they, with, they have guns and all that. And with that, of course, they will get what they want. Yeah. So it was imminent that they were going to come out. And now they have come out. And if you notice, in coming out, um, first, their source of supply of even arms is running out. So check where the targets were. First, they had to go to Goza, uh, which is the home of training for Nigeria's mobile police force. Mm. They went there, they got arms, got, you know, um, I hear they, they occupied the, uh, the training school and got some of the instructors to train their people. And not only that, they started looking at places like, you know, cities like Bama. I think there's a major barrack or something there. They, they really wanted that. You know, they, they, they were attacking military installations. That, that's the target, to replenish the depleting, uh, their depleting armory. Really? And then, you know, so um, they started taking over these cities. Um, it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's displacement, which we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, but it's also like smoking them out, consciously or unconsciously, because they're being starved from the border areas. They have to come inwards. So it's not like deliberately they are bored of the one to capture. Of course, that, they claim that is the objective. But enter into the cities, isn't that a win-win for the insurgency? Um, I'd say it's a good thing and a bad thing. Mm. You know, they're coming out which means now the Nigerian military, you know, the Nigerian armed forces now have an opportunity for a confrontation, a direct confrontation with them, okay? Um, as, as they come out, of course, now we know where they are. We now know, for instance, that if you go to a place like Goza, for instance, they have occupied the Emir's Palace, the people in the city have abandoned the place, which means if you shell the place, more than likely it is the, it is the insurgents that you will get. Yeah. Although in, so, in certain places they go to you and say, look, guys, stay, we're not going to do anything to you and all that. But that's because they also want, uh, they, they anticipate that if the military should attack them, collateral damage, and the military may not want to, you know, uh, attack them. So they're coming out, they're attacking cities. If you look at, for instance, they tried Bama, they lost it, if you look at the map. Yeah. All they need to do now is bridge these two places and they have a complete territory. Mm. But this is something the army must not allow.
Mm -hmm. The Army is in familiar terrain now. The Air Force has been deployed right now. There are gunships, you know, going out there and, you know, um, throwing uh, bombs at them. And then the ground forces are mopping up after them. Um, it's not going to be an easy battle. Uh, these guys are obviously very well armed. And uh, armed not just from what they're getting from the other places, but also arms they have collected, they have taken from, from Nigeria's armory. You, you know, know, I'm also looking at the transition from guerrilla to conventional warfare. Yes. But, for instance, we cannot confirm that there are no longer civilians in towns captured now by Boko Haram. No, but of course I said to you that they get to these towns and in some cases they say, look, guys, don't, we won't harm you, just stay where you are. So that gives them a bigger advantage even than the Sambisa forest? N not necessarily. And I'll tell you why. Um, you see... There are certain things that will force them. What I would advise the military, I'm not, I don't claim to be in a position to do that mm. anyway, uh, but what I would advise is we need to adopt a situation of what I would call anticipate and checkmate. What, I, what, right now, what are their greatest needs? Food, okay? Armory. Um, if you like, shelter. They need, they need to take care of their people. They need money. They need food. They need shelter. I mean, uh, shelter. They need, they need arms. Mm. Where are these things? Where are these things located? You can be sure that these are likely targets. Mm. Okay, they are likely to attack barracks. They are likely to attack police stations. They are likely to attack uh, uh, armories. Okay, they are likely also to go to places where uh, cities where you find markets. You know where food stuff. You know the great trade. There are some trading towns in these territories, mm. you know, where they can go and replenish their stock, get bags of rice, beans, and things like that. Mm. If you cut off the supply, if you, if, you, if you wait for them in places like that, more than likely, they will come. That's all right. Let's turn our attention to the internally displaced person. The yeah. UN High Commission of Refugees put it at 650,000 as of June this year. Yes. And just yesterday, the Kano State Governor is saying it's over 4 million. You had the National Emergency Management Agency uh, spokesperson that we spoke with earlier from Mediguri, who said that there are just 26,000 of them in, presently in orientation camps. How do you uh, match these figures together? Well, um, all the figures we heard earlier on have been, I mean, these are long in coming. Uh, there are no verifiable facts. We can only, if you like, guesstimate, if I may use that language. Um, however, uh, internal displacement is not something that just happened. It's been long in coming. Mm. When they started killing the Christians, I'm aware, for instance, that there are a lot of them, when they started killing Christians initially in Borno, a lot of them moved to as far as Plateau State, you know, just an environs. I'm personally mm. aware. A lot of Christians moved out. Um, in the recent past, of course, the bombs don't discriminate anymore. The bullets don't discriminate. Christians, Muslims, uh, male, female, children, everybody, you know. So people are moving out. As they move into the cities, as they move out of Zambisa, uh, people are moving. Um, the NEMA chief, what he was talking about there is probably... Um, the people that they are catering to at the moment, people who have surrendered themselves, you know, under their care. Remember that a lot of people were, in some of the recent attacks, were going to military barracks. Mm. And the military, in anticipation of the fact that these people may want to come and attack, particularly where the arms are and all that, have said mm. to people, please, even this place may not be 100% safe because they're likely to come here. Mm. And so, Nema, uh, he, he mentioned, I think, a secondary school, somewhere, and then you mentioned the NYC orientation yeah. uh, camp. Camps. Um, you know, um, because there are also reports of our mortuary schools being turned into camps these days. Come again? I said there are reports of our mortuary schools yes. being turned into turned camps into, these in, days. Into camps, mm. exactly. So now, what is happening here is these are people who they have been able to receive. Mm. Some have made provision for themselves. Some are moving to other cities and towns where they have friends and family. So, although it may say to you 26,000, the number may be larger. But you can only talk about the number that you, you know, you are aware of, the figures that you actually have. Mm. I mean, displacement simply means being displaced from where you are, your comfort zone, to somewhere else. 
And so if I move from my house to my neighbor's house, I've been displaced. Mm. Okay? If I move to my... My wife, for instance, may come from a different town. And nothing is happening there right now. And I know her family will receive me. Okay? If I move there, that's some form of internal displacement as well. I may be comfortable, not as comfortable as I am mm. where I'm coming from. But I've moved over there. I'm not under the care of government, but I'm under the care of family. So there's that form of displacement as well. Some have moved to neighboring countries. I was going to well. get there. You know, the Cameroon, the, the, Chad. Mm, you know, the uh, imagination of uh, thinking of Nigerians as refugees in neighboring countries begs the question of what exactly has been done by the federal government to provide provide welfare for those people. We've talked about close to a quarter of the 2014 budget, you know, going into fighting insurgency. Mr. President already proposed a $1 billion loan. But there seems that there seems to be much attention on fighting insurgency, getting equipment, you know, technological progress. But not much has been talked about, um, you know, donating money, you know, helping the less privileged, especially now, now the let internet displaced people. Let me ask people. you a question. The 26,000, for instance, mm. that have been displaced, that is under the care of NEMA right now. If you say, okay, these are, you, you, you forget the arms and you take care of them, obviously in the shortest possible time, these people would have no way, they would be attacked as well. So I think it's important to secure, you know, these territories. Okay. It's, it's, it's very, very important. The issue of um, the uh, internally displaced persons right now, um, especially those now that have nowhere to go to, is a much more recent development. It's been ongoing, don't get me wrong, but it, it's not as serious as now that they have come out, the insurgents have come out of the forest mm. and are now beginning to overrun towns and cities. Okay? Now, this is a recent problem. Now, no one saw this coming. I mean, it's, it's possible to expect that such a thing may come, but Quite frankly, none of us, I think, saw it to the extent that it is right now. Mm. That these insurgents would be bold enough and would have been able to overrun whole cities and towns. Mm. Okay? So this is a recent problem. Uh, the issue of asking for one billion for arms is in place. I don't see anything wrong with it. Because as we know and as we have been told, these guys don't come with guns and irregular AK-47s and all. They come with rocket propellers. You know? How can you fight a man? How can you come with an AK-47 when a guy is coming with a rocket uh, propeller at you, you know? And our regular soldiers don't go about banding rocket propellers. These things are for mass destruction. Is it okay? possible that we balance the issue of security no, no. Okay. and welfare on no, the I'm same coming, scale? No, I'm coming, I'm coming to that. Okay. Um, the government is not unmindful of that, and they're doing something about it. Ask me how. You will recall that in, in still anticipating and checkmate, if you like, and in, in, as, as a way of you know, um, uh, checking this. Because, you see, we have a problem here. Too many things have been politicized. If the president had asked for uh, an extra budget to cater for this, or to, for this, uh, to this particular issue, you would still hear people say, ah, no, they want to use it for 2015 and all that. And so what does he do? He calls friends and people who have the love of Nigerians at heart and say, look, let's Let's come and put together some money to take care of people like this. And you will recall that there was a launch recently, you know, fundraising occasion recently in Abuja, where captains of industry, you know, uh, bank chiefs, you know, uh, blue chip companies from stock exchange and all that, yeah. and individuals, people like Elimelu and the rest, I mean, Angote and the rest, came and they donated billions towards causes like this, towards a cause like this. It is for this purpose. So we cannot say the government has not been proactive in this regard. Indeed, if they had gone like they asked for $1 billion extra budgetary to be able to take care of the depleting, uh, um, if you like, um, uh, military infrastructure, let me use that language, and people were shouting and opposing it, you know, without any due regards to what it really, to what it really stands for. Yeah. You know, so uh, I think the president, in his wisdom, has decided, you know, if he goes back to say, let, I mean, you don't spend more. You will spend more as is budgeted for. Yeah. There was no provision for entirely displaced persons. I don't think he would have included that in, 
in, in the budget to the extent that it is today. I want us to consider you know? the fact that this money is kick started way back from 2009. Yes. Now, the role that all of these play in ensuring the patriotic nature of an average Nigerian. Uh, the primary responsibility of every government, they say, is welfare and security. Yes. For instance, we have over 200 Chibor girls in abduction, yes. as we yes. speak. Now, there's been a lot of outcry that government should compensate people who have been victims of Boko Haram yes. in time past. Yes. Because now, I, I want us to talk about how this can impact on how patriotic a victim would be. If, for instance, I'm a victim of a Boko Haram attack and then there was no help from the government in any way, what do I think of Nigeria no, 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 as but, a country? But that has just been done. That's what I said No, we're you. talking now... The this, fund that was raised... This is relative to what is happening presently okay. in Northeast Nigeria. Yes. I'm making reference to what has been happening thus far since 2009, where government came out to say that we are not going to compensate you know, the presidency said we are not, we don't have resources to do that. No, you have to be careful about the issue of compensation, and I'll tell you why. Um, for instance, there are people who have accused uh, the, the Joint Task Force, starting from even the Niger Delta up to now, of sometimes perpetuating, you know, uh, some of this crisis for their own benefits, because, of course, if there's insecurity, it means there will be greater budget and okay. people have more access to money and things like that. Um, there have been allegations like that. Now, the issue of displacement, the first thing the government owes people is security. Not Compensation is important, don't get me wrong. Yeah? But first, I mean, what of what is compensation to dead people? We're talking about compensating, let's say, the Chibok, and I, I want to repeat, till tomorrow, for all those who are talking about Chibok and the rest, nobody has said anything about those over 100 young kids who were killed in the federal government college somewhere in Yobe. Their families are there. No one is talking about them, you know, and things like that. I think the first thing to do is to see how we can stop the killings, how we can stop the madness that is happening in the North. Is it impossible secure... that we do the two at the same time? No, I'm not time. saying it's impossible. I'm coming to that, okay? okay? We need to secure that. You know, and while securing that, then we need to begin to put things in place. Now, you don't say, okay, your house was destroyed. How can you? you if you don't secure a place, how can you rebuild the place? Okay? People have lost houses. They've lost so much. Okay? It's only when all of this is over that you can now say, gentlemen, now let's look at what has happened. The Emir's Palace was bombed because it was necessary to do that to secure the place. Emir, let's rebuild your palace. These villagers have been displaced. Let's see how we can build new settlements yeah. for you. Your children have been out of school. What can we do about it? Schools have been displaced. What can we do? You know, these things, you've got to be able to prioritize. Now, side by side, first, the people must even be able to come together. Okay? How can you get people who are running up and down to say, let's do compensation? And you know how things are in this place. The real people will, you may not even get them. You will now get people who will come and stand and say, okay, look, my son was displaced by you, know, and things like that. You need some form of, you know, there has to be, you, there has to be sanity in place. There has to be peace. There has to be some form of organized, um, how do I put it, atmosphere, you know, in which, a sane atmosphere in which you can now say, okay, come. Where are the people that have been displaced? You know, Victor. It happened in mm -hmm. the Niger Delta. First, there was peace, and then the next phase was some form of reconciliation. Some have also questioned the moral justification of that. Uh, the same. Why would you justify? Why would you compensate someone who took arms? against an instituted government and then say there is no means to compensate someone who was a victim of insurgency. You have asked, well, some of them have been sent abroad now to, you know, take one course or the other. And there are many thousands of Nigerians who have been victims of insurgency and nothing has been done yet as we speak. No, I think there's a need to understand what is going on. Uh, what happened in the Niger Delta is completely, completely different from what's happening in the Northeast. Okay. In Niger Delta, there was, there was, there was a course. Um, 
in this case is where a people whose land had been ravished for so long by institution there was neglect by government and people were exploiting their resources they were if you like the most among the most backward and yet this was like the cash cow of the country you know the place that was producing the greatest resources so it was injustice that was recognized even by the international community okay okay the international community recognized the level of injustice that was being perpetrated in the Niger Delta. And when this was going on, you know, these people took arms, and these arms, if you notice, when all this was going on, what was happening was they were destroying, uh, they were not, they, they, it was not necessarily against the Nigerian government. They were destroying facilities, you know, of the oil companies that were, you know, destroying the ecosystem in the area. Yeah. They were kidnapping people, not killing the people, what they simply wanted was a voice they needed to be heard and they were and they had people who were speaking for them okay and you recall that the current president who was governor in Bayasa at the time went into the creeks to negotiate you know he was vice president he was governor and as vice president went to the creeks to negotiate and when they spoke to this we were ready to talk and when they had peace terms. Now, Boko Haram, they had, they had leaders in the Niger Delta, people you could talk to. Boko Haram is not willing to negotiate. What is the ideology? What do they want? One, they say, they're talking about schools. I mean, the fact that they don't want Western education. Um, some have said maybe not. Uh, they're saying that they want to institutionalize Islam as a religion across the country, not just in the territory that they occupy, they have decided to wage war against the Nigerian state. This is completely different. It happened in Biafra. That was why the government took up arms against them. This is what is happening here. Now, the Niger Delta never said they were seceding. They never said they were going to take over uh, Nigeria. They We're actually referring to the victims of Boko Haram in this case, not well, even members of yeah, Boko Haram. But victims, okay, mm. fine. The question is, you need, you, we need to have, you see, I've told you already that something is already in place. Let's, 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 let's get that in place. The president has called his friends and people who, who care, okay. you know, so that this is not politicized again, mm. to say, gentlemen, can we put together some, can you join me and let's raise some funds to help victims okay. of this insurgency. And, and they have come together and they have put money, led by, you know, T. White and Juma. A committee is in place to take care of this. What they're doing, you and I may not know yet. It's all right. But something is already happening. Between Nigerian military and Boko Haram, the fate of internally displaced persons is our focus on the show this Tuesday. We'll take a short break now and we'll be back with more. Of course, opening the phone line to hear from you. Don't go away. TV News, expanding your view. From time immemorial, women have birthed life, shaped character, and by extension, influenced the society. Morimi of Ife, a Moten of Benin, Queen Aminat of Zaria, all women of influence and power. Whether it's before election, after election. How ironical. Women being so powerful, yet have few grounds in decision making. They see you as weak. And I see you as a wife to a man. We are talking women in politics. A woman will be bold enough to stand up and say, I want to become president of Nigeria. Only on Core TV News.
Welcome back. It's Cold Arches Tuesday edition. Thank you for joining us again. Earlier, we heard from the coordinator Nema in Northeast Nigeria, who called from Medjugorje and confirmed that there were about 26,000 internally displaced persons in Medjugorje. As we speak in different camps, schools, and YSC camps, and all of that. And also, it made us to understand that their welfare has been taken care of. There are ongoing collaborations with the international community, neighboring west african countries that are presently harboring some displaced nigerians as a result of the ongoing insurgents attack in northeast nigeria we'd love to hear from you especially if you are a victim of um insurgency in northern nigeria we want to hear your story perhaps you are also uh, in one of the camps as we speak who want to know what the welfare and the security is like with you over there keep your call coming when you do so endeavor to turn down the volume of your tv set well but would it be realistic to have an internally displaced person watching tv as we speak right now that would be a very comfortable victim <laughs> <laughs> well, especially because also this is um, um, on cable TV. Mm. Um, so, but anyway, um, it will be nice to hear from someone from Medjugorje in particular, mm. from Bama as well, uh, and from some of the other neighboring it's uh, all right. towns. You had um, him, the NEMA spokesman, who talked about um, collaboration between Nigeria and countries like Cameroon and Chad. What do you think should be done? Because there's so much emphasis on putting a face, you know, on the victim, of course, a representation, a victim of this insurgent attack. For instance, many are asking, is, is the Nigerian people too many for the Nigerian government to cater for? What would be your own opinion as regards Nigerians who are in neighboring countries as a result of insurgency? No, you see, I don't think it's fair to say that uh, uh, it's either too many for the Nigerian government to take care of. When think this is a war situation, let's not make many bones, let's not pretend about it. Uh, and these people have fled. Okay? They're not refugees in these towns. You can't even convince them to come back. They're traumatized. Okay? And under United Nations. Um, if you like laws and rules and all that. These countries are bound mm. by international conventions to take care of them, okay? Um, and it's not that Nigeria cannot take care of them, but that's, I mean, they're there right now, so they must provide shelter for them. They must take care of them. They have to. Uh, in Cameroon, in Chad, and so on. Uh, they've been displaced from their original place as a result of... Uh, Let's go by his name, War. Just a minute, we have a caller from Kano. Okay. Good morning, Mohammed. Thank you for holding on. Go on. Good morning. Morning, please go ahead with your contribution. Go ahead, please. Yes, I can, clearly. Go ahead. I'm afraid the reception is poor. Please do call us again, Mohammed. We'd love to hear from you. We're talking about um, Nigerians and neighboring countries who fled there and, you know, what is expected of the Nigerian government at this time? Um, at this time, like I said, international conventions have taken care of that. Um, there are internally displaced persons we take care of. Those ones that are in those places are covered by international law, mm. okay? Of course, we'll have to find a way to bring them back, but to where? That's the question, okay? Mm. Their houses and all that have been overrun by insurgents. You don't want to bring them... They're safe where they are right now. Mm. And there's no point bringing unnecessary sentiments into the issue. They are safe where they are. Uh, if they had problems in the countries they come in, Nigeria is bound to take care of them as well. Mm. You know, so 
that's what the situation is, okay? So it's not something to say, oh, is it that Nigeria cannot take it? No, that's not it. Mm -hmm. They're there, and by law, international law, they should be taken care of as refugees in those countries. We did that for Liberians. We did that for, you know, and, 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 and that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. If people come from other countries as a result of war. So those ones are there. They're being taken care of. That's, taken, that's, that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. After everything, we can then bring them back home, find a place for them, and rehabilitate them properly. You know, it, it's one thing to make financial provision. It, it's another thing to have a system that can coordinate that well, because you made mention of that earlier. You recall the flooding in Nigeria, I think it was in 2012 thereabout, and the federal government gave out some funds. It was so bad, I was in a doorstep then, and some people came out to say all they got was 200 naira, as ridiculous as that sounds. But you know, but you know that this is, for a fact, this is the situation. Even in Lagos State, the governor was accused, although he's tried to see, he can, he's tried to absorb himself. You see, most times we sit down, we look at the center and, and say, it's like the issue of Shopee and the rest. I mean, uh, you know, state governments are receiving the allocation. They are just, permit me to put it in pidgin English, chopping, chopping and cleaning mouth like say nothing happened. Okay? The issue of floods, and eco uh, ecological funds and all the disaster funds and things like that, state, people are not holding their local government chairmen, their state governors accountable. When things go so, Everything is the president. Everything is the federal government. I'm glad you brought this up. You know, you were in a door, like you said, and then people say they got 200. In all honesty, if this money was properly appropriated, is that what they should have gotten? You know, is that the extent of the damage? Would that What would that have done to them? Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm. So we play too much politics and we don't hold the right people accountable. We don't hold the right people accountable. We keep looking miles away at the center. The center will play its part, and then the states will now, the, the state governments will just keep quiet, sit on these phones, misappropriate them. And this has gone on for too long. It's like the issue of security. Everybody says the government, the government, I will keep saying something. Lagos State government, for me, is a model. Because this was one state that internationally, Everybody was like a pariah state. When they say Nigeria is not safe, it's Lagos they were talking about. Ah, Lagos is not safe. Not... But how did Fashola do it? That today, you find that you can move about the streets, and yet the man in, 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 in Bono State will come and say, oh, no, the federal government is not doing it. The one in Adama, the one in Yobe. They'll abdicate their responsibilities mm -hmm. and say, no, we are, you know, you are the first line of defense for your people in your state as a state governor, in your local government, as a local government chairman, yeah. your, as a councillor your, for, for your ward. You know, you are the man that the local policeman will see. You are the person that the local... In each of these states, there are security meetings, you know, committees, state governments, I mean, state commissioners of police, the, the brigade commanders where they, you have them, or the GOCs, and the SSS, they all meet. And if as a state governor you cannot coordinate this local security and you are looking to Abuja, then you are a failure. Yeah. We have seen governors who have effectively managed the situation in their states. They have provided, they have, from their security budgets, they all have huge security votes. What do you use them for? Yeah. Is, it to, is it to secure your stomach? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So if you use these funds appropriately mm. and liaise with these forces, your state will be secure. It's all right. We'd love to hear from you. I understand we have a little challenge with the phone line. Keep trying. Whenever you call, turn down the volume of your TV so we can have a crystal clear communication. Now, beyond all of that, we're talking about, I just want to know in your own opinion, how far away Nigeria is as a nation to genuine patriotism. You know, it's normal for an average Nigerian to say, the whole of the U.S. can go to war for an American. But then we have a situation in our hands where over 200 of our girls have been taken away for over three months. And some are saying that's very significant, sending, uh, in quote, wrong messages to the average Nigerian of what would happen if I am in trouble and what the federal government can do to save a Nigerian soul. Okay. 
I will take the issue of saving the Nigerian soul last, but let me throw a question to you. You are a Nigerian like I am. If you were in the position of the government, how would you go about saving those 200, over 200 girls that are with the insurgents? How would you do it and ensure that they all come back alive? At a point, Victor, the Boko Haram representation, I mean representative, came out clear yes. that we have them in our custody. Yes. All you need to do is give us our men that are with you for an exchange. Victor, if you were in government, what now would you do? Let me ask you a question. No, fine, not a problem. Not a problem. The people who are in captivity, who have been caught, they're carrying information, they're dangerous elements, they have killed Nigerians, mm. okay? You want to send them back free. I don't think that makes sense. The minute you do that, what happens again? You capture more of them, then they capture more innocent people, and then you trade off. For how long can you continue doing that? There comes a time when you need to call the, call the bluff, you know, of these people and let them know that they cannot get away with it. Okay? While you're still planning, for now we know the girls are safe. They're not dead. That's good. Okay? It's only a matter of time. How sure are you about that? Well, so far, as far as we know so far. Okay. As far as we know so far. Okay? Um, to the best of our knowledge, you and I. <laughs> okay? And Boko Haram has not said otherwise. They didn't threaten to kill them if. And they have not done that yet. Mm. Okay? So, to, as far as we know, they're safe. They're not dead like the over 100 school kids, I'll keep repeating it, who were killed in Yubi. Mm. As long as there's life, there's hope. Mm. Okay? If you attempt to go there, there will be collateral damage. You might not come back with one girl alive. Remember the case in, was it Sokoto or so, uh, the, the British and Italian, you know, who were, who were captured somewhere in Zaria mm. and taken to somewhere there. I was personally there, you know, as, uh, you know, uh, uh, this was to report for the BBC, okay? When I took pictures of all the rooms where the toilets where they were where, 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 where they were murdered these people had been in that place the neighbors never knew that you know the people were held captive there all the way from uh what is it now from around zaria where they were captured but through intelligence somehow they discovered and when the army got the go ahead from the british uh counterparts to storm the place they went, unfortunately, in the process of trying mm. to rescue these people. Of course, the captors, uh, you know, the first thing they did was eliminate these people. They killed them. If perhaps they had been a bit more patient and had not succumbed to pressure, maybe, just maybe, maybe, there would have been another way of getting these people out alive. Mm. I think we should be patient with government. Okay. And trust, and trust government. How far are we away from genuine patriotism? Yes, that's, that's a good question. The day we stop politicking with the most mundane things, we have, we have our leaders in this country are a disappointment to the young generation. They will politic with anything, anything. You see, it is important for us to realize that every single life is important. The Chibok girls we are politicking with, the innocent lives, nobody is talking about them. Those families, are they not agonizing? I would be happier if the people who are talking about Chibok, Chibok, will organize and say, let them go and sympathize with the families of those who have lost their people. Are those, those, don't those lives count for anything? But we'd rather play politics. You know, and, and be seen on national television. I can assure you that if there was no press media coverage, the people who are doing this, they would not do it. It's not that it's not important, mm. okay? But let's stop politicking. And let's, let every life begin to count. Let, let's begin to see that what is good for A is good for B. Okay. okay? The minute we begin to do that, then I think that's the beginning of... We have of, a call yeah. from Enugu. Hello, yeah. Jude. Good morning, Jude. 
Oh, I'm afraid we lost that. Oh, we'll no. try to get your calls. I, I know the traffic is high on the phone line. Just keep <laughs> trying. If we can hear from you, we'll really, really, really be nice appreciate it. Yeah. On the front page of the news, I mean, of the papers today, Victor, Obasa Johnson shot in movie attack. Yes. And ambushed by colleagues by Boko Haram. Honestly, my first reaction to that is there are several other unknown soldiers who have died. Why should these make so much of noise in memory of those ones? <laughs> well, it's the same Nigerian problem, but also, also, this is news. You're in the media. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is news. Okay, um, but it's bringing it home, sad to say. I'm, mm. I'm sorry to say so. You see, this is a situation now where they say if you know, before now, the people that have been died, just statistics. Oh, a thousand people died. Okay? Mm. Uh, I mean, oh, 200 people killed, 50 people killed, mm. and all that. Now someone is shot in the leg. He's not even dead yet. And he takes front page. Mm. It's where we are. And this has got to change. Every life must count. Every life must count. Every single life must count. Okay? Mm. The young man like many other soldiers are fighting for this country we need to show respect we need to support them we need to appreciate okay. that they are putting their lives on the line mm. for the safe so that you and i can sleep well at night on the garden boko ram kills 24 soldiers in just a passenger's son now thousands allegedly flee to yola we're talking about the possibility of pressure on neighboring northern states of course that also would tell on the resources that they have some of them that have been collecting security votes will not have what reason or other to spend. But what impact do you think that would have on the economy of the states? You know, of course, if you now recall... Of the nation, of the nation in general. The national economy. But yes. at the same time, I want us to link it with, you know, what actually kick-started this Boko Haram issue. The, 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 the Amadjiri tendency, the poverty tendency in northern Nigeria. Would this, would this, you know, migration of people from one region to the other on mass how would that impact on this issue of poverty well first of all uh, we are a largely agrarian society and um, i don't know if i'm right to say so but i think most of the food we eat in this country comes from northern nigeria and particularly from that axis um, and so this would have an effect on food security <laughs> as well because next year next year I'm not saying there might be farming, but there might be there might not be enough food. Because the people who are supposed to be farming are being displaced. Okay? Their farmlands are being ravaged. Okay? And with the displacement that we're having, um, it's going to take its toll, obviously, on the economy of these neighboring states. Mm. And uh, of course on, on on the rest of the country. And you recall that a lot of the friction we have in this country is as a result of internal migration. Um, there's some things we don't take, we are not even looking at. That particular axis, Lake Chad, for instance, has mm. been drying up and drying up. It's mm. a major source of um, water, you know, for agriculture in that part. And because of the increasing desertification of the area, you find a lot of movement. And also, you, this cattle, um, the full herdsmen that you find in clashes with people in Plateau and the rest, mm. this is because. Because of desertification in that part, there's a, a lot of pressure mm. coming southwards. Mm. As they come, they need to feed. Just hold your thought a little. Okay. Let's see if we can make this call. It's from Port Harcourt. Kenneth. Yes. Let's go ahead with the contribution. Hello, good morning, sir. Go ahead, please, morning, Kenneth. Yes, please. If I is just a little question. Which Yes, because I know this is a yes, this is a very very nice forum. I like it so much. I want to know what we what becomes of uh, the people that we are at the onset of uh, this uh, insurgency, this place from the northern part of uh, the country. I mean, the people from the south, southeast, and uh, maybe southwest. You know, a lot of people were at this place. Now we are talking of compensation, compensation. What becomes of them? What happens to them? It's all right. I'm sure you got that. I did. Mm. Um, the Nigerians, mm. 
and it's a good thing he's brought it up. And they're entitled to compensation as well. Uh, first, our constitution guarantees us, a, a, you know, the right to live wherever we want to in this country and mm. own mm. property. You know, um, and the displacement is across board. Uh, I, like I said earlier, people have been displaced. Some have gone back. Some have left these towns and gone back to the south east, like you said, to the southwest mm. and to other places where they have family and, and, and friends, mm. less mm. hostile places, for instance. And so when you're talking about compensation, where do you begin from? How do you assemble this? It's only in peace times that you can begin to talk about it mm. because it's difficult to get accurate data right now and to get statistics of those who have been displaced or to reach them. You know, so that's... that's it's that's about time where we also need to talk about this data collection of a thing. Why is it taking long? No, no, no. Under, the no under the circumstances... No, under the circumstances, you can't talk about it effectively uh, because people are moving every day by the second, almost literally. Um, as we're speaking right now, um, I'm sure fight is going on between the military and, and the insurgents, and people are being displaced and moving. And um, well, it will take a while to know exactly how mm. many and where people have gone to and all that. And people have to be forthcoming mm. for you to know. You know, so um, it will take time, but eventually we'll get there. Not everyone is going to get it, but of course. It's all right. Yeah. We're rounding up now. What, what would you say should be the disposition of an average Nigerian in this troubling time? Um, what I would say is um, the day we stop seeing ourselves in ethnic gaps, religious uh, gaps, sectional and political gaps, and we begin to see ourselves as, Ni as Nigerians mm. first, mm. And then that will be the beginning of our greatness. For as long as we, 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 we begin, as for as long as we separate or be, we segregate along these lines, okay. we will never, we will never, we will never know peace. We will never. Let's hear uh, Usman out. Forward. Usman is calling from Kaduna. Welcome to Cold Digest. Hey, good morning. Morning. Go good ahead morning. with the contribution, please. Yes, um, I just want to ask uh, my good friend, uh, friend about the. Uh, I uh, want to ask you a question. If Azul is one son or his one daughter with a mark of this just gay that scaffold, um, that's, uh, that's uh, 200, among the 200 people gay, you will not sit down there telling people that they should not go in the place with Boko Haram because he's called his daughter, it's not a mark of those gay. Because if any woman be any man or woman that have a daughter, you have a daughter that inside those days, you know the strength that go inside somebody's mind. If you come sitting down there, bring sleep the eggs with the children. That's why you're spending that you not a king believes your the place war and you did before the of those days. Thank you very much, Father. Mm. I'm sure he's reacting to no, your no, position okay. on the action. Usman, I want to thank you very, very much for uh, your observation and your contribution. And I feel exactly what you're talking about. And I agree with you that there's nobody whose child will be among those 200 uh, or more girls that would not want to say negotiate. Believe me, you're, you're right. And, and that will be the first thinking the problem is that these things are not as easy as they appear and why is that so the people you are talking to are they reasonable can you trust them the negotiator we're talking about the uh, davis man said there were some that were going to be handed over to him and then another group came and captured and and and, and overpowered the first group and left with them the question is can you trust these people are you sure that if you do it, they would release them? What is comforting for me is the fact that these girls are still alive. And as long as they're alive, there is hope. Okay? So that is, for me, what is important at this moment. By the grace of God, and we are praying, and I'm sure the government is working, hopefully, these girls will come back. 
they will meet with their parents and you know hopefully they will, they will be they, they will take care of them again properly i sympathize with the families don't get me wrong i feel bad about what is going on personally but how can you go negotiation is one thing can you negotiate with these people please hold your thoughts trusted let's take this call from mina this is hadam welcome to call digest hello adam hello how are you i'm terrific please go ahead with your contribution thank you very much uh yes how are you yes uh actually i was surprised in the victim the most important thing the world is uh all about nigeria we've seen other rapes in other parts of the world and the thing that you felt to say but the thing you fail to realize is that when you are talking about Nigeria, you don't look at what it is to the other person from the other end. You see, there are so many media houses all over the world, but we've had their own opinion, not just his own opinion that he thinks is talking to just the Nigerian audience. And we've had of other conspiracy theories about this Boko Haram. For example, why is it that it is easier for them to cut away these girls and join it? They fight cash and they go court to does he look at that implication of it? Did he ever care to listen to what the other media houses are saying? For example, BBC, for example, BBC Hausa was relating to us that some of the Nigerian army who were involved were talking to BBC that the people they were fighting with are the same people that they treat together with in Quentin War, military base there. Yeah. Have they ever heard of that conspiracy theory? From BBC World Services Hausa, and he is sitting there saying something, thinking that we don't listen to other media houses. The leader might care to, uh, to him to know the implication of what this is going to Nigeria. For example, now in the northern part of the country, the troll is now like five naira. Instead of like seven naira, what is happening? The north is looking at the other alternative, going to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, in Katuya. Wow, quite touching there. Thank you very much for your contribution. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. You see, he, he brought a very uh, important uh, point there. It's the complexity of this thing that makes it unique and different. And for his information, I listen to the BBC Hausa service. I speak Hausa, I read it, I write it. Very well, not, I mean, very, very well. And so I follow. Now, talking about conspiracy theory, don't forget, we talk about even distrust among the military. This thing is more complex than meets the eye. It's easy. I can come here and say what everybody else is saying, or people want to hear. Oh, negotiate. Can you? Who are you negotiating with? Can you trust the people you are negotiating with? Is there an arrowhead like the case in the Niger Delta where you had people you could talk to? We have seen Shekau on television. Is it someone? You can talk to is it someone willing to talk okay what on what terms are you sure we're not shy those who are close victor are you sure we're not yeah. shying away from uh, uh, uh in court incompetency on the part of leadership because um uh, i do uh, not for instance now believe me leadership this is not the cannot first be time absorbed. this is not the first time negotiation is taking place in the world i agree us did it israel did it i mean there are benchmark world uh, international procedures that nigeria could have learned from we're talking about how symbolic how significant the abduction of these 200 over 200 girls were and the steps that leadership could have taken recall that it took the federal government three weeks to even acknowledge that an abduction took place so can you easily absorb leadership of all of these challenges whatever happens the box stops at the table of leadership okay. and so no one can be absorbed mm -hmm. that's the truth okay what has happened has happened and the man that takes the blame obviously is a man at the helm of affairs at the state level at the federal level at the local government level even the principal of that school whose daughter miraculously quote unquote escaped okay i'm just wondering how you know you you, you if the government was hesitant initially it's probably because of the way it happened how on earth they could have come to that place 
captured all those girls. No one made a phone call. The whole thing just happened the way it happened. Well, it has happened, okay? But I think what we should do now is, as Nigerians, and I said to Adam, I said to Usman, I feel what is happening. And it's not just about words. I feel it, okay? I have daughters as well, and I, I know what it's like. But how do you go about it? We need the help of people who are on the ground locally. They will give us information, okay? We need, we need the cooperation of people around who know the people. If we don't get this cooperation, we can't. That's all right. Victor Hai, veteran public affairs analyst. I love that veteran. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank that's you your, very much for your, for, well, for your time you. on the show today. Thank Would you, you for mind shaking me. my hand? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. All well, right. thanks for your contribution. We got calls all the way from Kano, Kaduna, Enugu, Mena, and Potakot. quite a number of them there from Potakot as well. Quite a number of calls we could not pick. We apologize if we could not pick your call today. But Call Digest continues tomorrow all the way from half past nine. It runs till 11 o'clock. In-depth analysis and review of issues as they arise beyond and outside Nigeria. I am Nifemi Ogunto. We'll be back again with you tomorrow. Stay tuned for the top of the hour news. Don't go away. You can now watch Core TV News live from anywhere in the world on our website, www.coretvnews.com. Click on live TV on our website and watch us live. And welcome to Core TV Primetime News. To follow us on Twitter, click on Twitter icon on our website. On Facebook, click on the Facebook and YouTube to see all our previous news production. You can also watch us live on YouTube. Click Core TV, leave a space, then news. Core TV News, a 24-hour news station.